Good evening, dear viewers, and a warm welcome to the Visit series this Sunday evening. Today I have a request from parents who are confronted with the diagnosis of their daughter's epilepsy. The daughter is 15 years old and they were only very briefly confronted with this diagnosis and they asked for advice from a holistic perspective. What does it mean for us that our child has developed epilepsy? Now there are the seizure-like excitations of the nerve cell groups in this brain. On the one hand, this can be due to a spasmodically increased excitation capacity in the physiological transmission of information or that the inhibition of this excitation capacity is weakened. We have different forms of epileptic seizures. These can be focal, so limited, but these can also be generalised appearances. We're talking about small seizures, petit, we're talking about absences. That is, these children or people only have this loss of consciousness for a short time. You can see that. At school they suddenly write a lot of lines, have no handwriting and then they come back. And these different seizures are also supplemented by very symptomatic seizures that can occur in different inflammations that take place in the brain, also in pressure processes that take place in the brain. That is when a development for cell reproduction is there, then an epileptic event can be there. They can be caused by dental interference fields or they can also be caused by hypoglycemia, so due to low blood, blood sugar. There are a number of different causes which you can of course have checked after also, after also a symptomatic adjustment. This is how it will certainly happen very quickly but you should actually take the time to really clarify these things diagnostically. At these receptors within the excitation transmission, a change occurs in the sodium and potassium pump. If you want to understand it now from a purely biochemical point of view, and it's these neurotransmitters like GABA receptors, the opening of the potassium channels, all of that will be attributed to a reduced excitability of the nerve cells and with this reduce functionality. Then this overexcitability arises as a result. So the body compensates for another interference. However, these epileptic seizures can also be triggered by malnutrition. This means that, for example, chronic inflammatory processes that take place in the intestine also get projected onto the brain via the vagus nerve. Diet is really a big trigger here. It's related to glutamate, which is the big flavour enhancer that comes with aspartame with a sweetener, which I don't understand why it hasn't actually been banned for a long time. There is aspartame in chewing gum, which is a highly toxic effect on our brain health. On the other hand, flickering light causes epilepsy. Lack of sleep, periods of intense stress. And monosodium glutamate, which I already mentioned, but also for example, nicotine, or other heat and cold triggering exhaustion, hypoglycemia, but also the great toxicity of our life can be an epileptic co-causal event. When we look at someone with epilepsy, 
we first make sure that we clarify various things diagnostically. Now we perform dark field microscopy, also bioterrain analysis, where you actually find out about the whole acid-base balance. This is not possible for everyone, but what you absolutely have to do is rule out cryptopyloria. Cryptopyloria is still a very unnoticed metabolic disorder where these children or adolescents then excrete vitamin B6, zinc and manganese and especially zinc and these are of course essential B vitamins for nerve metabolism. Zinc serves hundreds of enzymes which the body then of course no longer serves and that is now scientifically proven disorder that could also lead to autism, schizophrenia, epilepsy and that we actually have already proven in the causal research that also the development of epilepsy can be caused here by an unrecognised cryptopyloria. Investigations in the context of detoxification metabolism at the cellular level of this cell energy metabolism, at the mitochondrial level through examination of nitrosative stress, oxidative stress, I think it's important to just tell you this first. Every therapist and every doctor who knows these things knows what examinations to arrange for. But a comprehensive intestinal diagnosis is very important because the gut is the root of the human plant. And today people, and especially young people, have, I would say, malnutrition with much, much, much too much sugar. This is a giant B vitamin robber. And through the opening of the intestinal mucosal barrier, I am now transferring hydrogen sulfide, scatol, ammonia into my organism. Also what happens in the intestines, and that's not all, Fat, protein, carbohydrates, amino acids, but parasites, fungi. All of this is an inflammatory process that is now happening on a physical level and can also lead to a toxic or inflammatory, let's say, clinical picture development in the brain. And it is very important that these things are then clarified. One can also do a food test regarding food intolerance. IgG, which shows us how much and which foods provoke inflammation in the intestine after four to 70 hours. And every chronic inflammation naturally creates a change here in the long term. It is important to also analyse inflammation parameters. TNF, alpha, tumour necrosis factor and also interleukin-6. These are all very important interleukins which show us indirectly that this is where the body is constantly starting by having to control the inflammatory process. There was an interesting study by Stephen Jacobson of the National Institute of Health in Maryland and he analysed patients who had a focal or median temporal lobe epilepsy for whatever reason. They removed that part of the temporal lobe that was a few years ago but he saw that a lot of these examined parts of the brain tissue contained herpes viruses, human herpes viruses. This also means that there are so-called neurogenic viruses. There are viruses that are activated more on the skin sector, including herpes viruses. There are papillomaviruses. So 
With papillomaviruses, for example, we know the Nobel Prize was awarded for that, there is a very close and causal relationship between papillomaviruses and cervical cancer. All the viral load today, also in the development of neurological or such diseases is still far from internalised, but one must also look here to what extent a reactivation of such human herpes viruses might play a role in this epilepsy. And you can also examine this in the laboratory. And you should investigate this so that you don't cope with epilepsy through seizure prophylaxis alone. The other thing is that also insulin resistance can be partly responsible for it. Insulin resistance, I think you know, the insulin is largely responsible for bringing the sugar into the cell. This requires a transporter system again. And these things are, for whatever reason now, no longer in balance. That is, due to insulin resistance, the insulin cannot dock and thus does not transfer the sugar into the cell. And for me, it's a standard therapy for all people with brain diseases with decreasing brain performance, but also epilepsy, Parkinson's, to always give patients galactose. Galactose is nutrient for the brain. Breast milk has a lot of galactose, so the child also has a strong development spurt in the first year of life and in brain maturation. And the galactose would in any case break through a possible present insulin resistance. This means the galactose can dock and via the glucose transporter and now actually ensure the mitochondrial, the cell energy supply for the cell. That means you should def definitely integrate it into the treatment. The other thing that's close to my heart at the moment, and I'm also speaking a bit from experience, especially with this clinical picture, a 16 year old girl with epilepsy. And the girl was always so tired from the drugs and kept falling asleep at school. And at that time, we also arranged to take a tooth panorama picture. And this tooth panorama picture showed at the time that the young girl had four impacted wisdom teeth. This means that the wisdom, wisdom teeth were now positioned in such a way that they will actually never have the chance in the girl's life to break through because the angle was such that the girl had no complaints yet, but behind you can feel it. These are the so-called Adler points. And when I pressed there, then she went up and always had this shoulder and neck tension too. And long story short, it was about time. The roots were already partially formed. That the teeth, the four teeth had to be removed. The parents then re-insured themselves again and the dentist wasn't actually ready also because to him it didn't cause any major problems but he didn't know the connection either and you always have to re recognize an interference field sometimes the interference field is only part of a whole event and it gives the body thus a better regulatory ability again and the person who regulates again will also work tomorrow and sometimes it is the interference field that makes this problem far from its localization. Also in epilepsy, it is emphasized again and again. Impacted wisdom teeth can also lead to epilepsy. And the parents weren't ready. And then I actually asserted myself at the time and told them I would share the responsibility for this procedure but I would like to ask you to do it. And I took a lot of time again. The parents allowed it and the epilepsy was controlled from that day. These are not always things that I have observed so clearly every time, but they are incredibly important to clarify. And sometimes it is also the case that children develop epilepsy and it's also very popular from a neurological point of view 
to say that can also grow together when they are bigger and that is sometimes also part of these processes that are stagnating, not moving forward. And then the problem, the tooth problem really grows because the teeth may lay very unfortunate but the body can adjust itself and then allow this normal change of teeth. Well, there are an incredible number of causes in the background. But here too, you should definitely visit a holistic dentist who at least clarifies that. The other thing is neurotoxic stress. Please do not underestimate that we live in a time where... Uh, we, well, I don't want to worry anyone, but I recently had my rainwater tested. And of course, we have a clinic in the mountains and we're proud of the climate we have around us. I was shocked by what I was suddenly analysing in the rainwater, which of course was in the groundwater and drinking water not recognisable at all. There are built-in filter stations, but this is atmosphere, this is rain, that's burden and that's what we inhale. Nobody talks about the health and the cleanliness of the air. We live in a country where air traffic is increasing all the time. It's all back to normal, what had calmed down for a while in the last year. On the other hand, the question is, do I live in the city? Do I have a high cadmium load? Do we live on a main road? Has my child already received a basic toxic load through pregnancy? And of course, there is a range of toxicity, including from glyphosate, through herbicides, through diets, through chemical warfare agents through the complexity of plastic and nanoparticles and bisphenol A. Well, I don't want to enumerate them here in detail, but I just want to say that it doesn't stop at us at all. And the same burden doesn't have to be the same development for a sibling or for the father or mother to di a disease because maybe... Your daughter has cryptopyloria, so your daughter has this chronic zinc deficiency and can no longer serve her own detoxification. And of course, there is a cumulative effect somewhere over many years and we are always very keen to analyse all of that. As part of these toxic exposure studies or heavy metal screen tests via the hand, then it's more of a connective tissue measurement. But you can also do it by administering a chelate after prior clarification to what extent the daughter is capable of detoxification herself and prepare her well for it but then you can also investigate such things. And of course, start at that point to help. That means epilepsy is only the appearance up there. But behind that, there can be an incredible number of things that I still need to have room to understand what actually happened. And how can we protect her? Of course, seizure prophylaxis is very important now. But of course, we also have experience with children that we say that they are seizure free due to a very strong and strict and good diet and have slowly been led back to these paths without medication. But I don't want to presume that and finally, I come to an essential point that I would like to give you all along the way. The fact is that the image of an epileptic seizure sometimes triggers a great deal of stress for the layperson because they don't really know what to do. And you can all come across someone every day 
on the street or on the train or at the station, wherever, who then has this epileptic seizure with convulsions. And I would like to ask that you also verify as an outsider, does this person need help now? That means there's absolutely no point in going crazy and having a crowd of people around, but you have to take care of them now. And you take care by letting this fit happen, by being very calm and by looking very quickly at the clock. When did this attack occur? You noticed it. So it's acute now and just register that time too and that you actually leave the affected person where they are but make sure they don't hurt themselves. That is the task now. That means if they have glasses, take them off. And if they are now lying very unfortunate with their head, then you try to position them well to support them. That they might quickly get a jacket slipped under them because they could injure themselves in the circumstances that are happening right now in this moment. But there is no reason for a restlessness, a panic or maybe a worry. You are not doing enough. The seizure is allowed to happen because the system is discharging. It's like a congestion that is opening now. And the people around, they just have to block a danger zone now. That this person can live out this attack undisturbed in quotation marks. And they, if they have a neckerchief or a scarf that somehow gets tangled, then they take it away from them or loosen them. You take off their glasses, as I said before, and lay them down well. And then when you notice that the seizure's coming to an end, you can put them in the stable side position too. But look after them lovingly until they wake up again. And also register the end a bit. So only if a seizure occurs again after five minutes, that's when they last longer than five minutes, or rather the seizure ends and then there is a second one. Or the attack is not over after five minutes, as I said, then call the emergency medical services. But otherwise, this is not an indication to get an emergency doctor immediately and very quickly because these things happen that way and that's how you behave at home and that's how you behave in every other relationship. So I wanted to pass that on to you and I think that also I also want to share a few thoughts about this need how do I behave in emergency situations from the perspective of a lay person with you again and again so that you go through life calmly and relaxed and with a lot of inner serenity and are able at this second to recognize a situation what is needed from oneself now with this in mind, I wish you all a wonderful Sunday evening and an even better week that now lies ahead of you. And I'm really looking forward to next Sunday. Goodbye.